Okay, settle down, settle down. Here are the answers to uh, that last exercise uh, for those who are tuning in with the video. Um, are there any issues or questions with any of the values that we arrived here today? Yes, question. Um, so like in a lot of science classes I learned about like where to, where to round off the numbers. Uh-huh. Did I do that to be in your class or just leave it at that one? Um, so the answer is it depends, but um, yeah, for things like finding the mean or the median, if you're talking about rounding, yeah, hundreds or thousands place is probably good. As the course goes on and we're dealing with different numbers, some are really small, um, we might, you might want to keep more decimals or not. Uh, generally, as my rule of thumb is that for steps in between, steps to get to the end of the problem, I don't do rounding, or I do as little rounding as possible. I try to keep as many decimals as I can, and only for the very last step will I round. Okay. There's um, there's going to be a point in our uh, class where we have to look up numbers on a reference table. Okay. And the reference table doesn't pr provide all the numbers, so when you look at the reference table, you're required to round because doesn't have all the numbers, it just says, for this number, it's this. So, so for the reference table, you're going to have to do some rounding, um, but my rule of thumb is do as little rounding as, as you need to, okay? Okay, so here are the answers to this. If, uh, if you didn't get these, write down these answers, and you can try on your own time to see if you can get these answers, okay? be useful, let that be a warning, or okay, to know, I mean, so we have a quiz next week, all right, and uh, you guys will need to know how to get all of these numbers, okay, that would be part of the quiz, okay, so just a warning, when you guys do your homework this week, I've covered some of the topics from this chapter a little bit out of order, okay, and in my opinion, you know, I teach the way I teach because I I prefer this this order or this arrangement of, of the stuff of the topics I teach. You know, the book chose chose to arrange it a different way. It doesn't matter, okay? As long as we're covering the same stuff, I think that's okay. Um, let me just talk a little bit about next week's quiz. Or, yeah, we have a question before we do. That. Oh, it was kind of about quiz. Um, so, are you going to cover anything on the quiz that you didn't cover in class? Okay, so on the this week's homework page, I tell you what you need to know for the quiz. Okay, it's, it's pretty detailed. It doesn't say exactly what the problems are, but it tells you what concepts you need to know. All right, it says it'll say you need to know how to get the mean and the median and the range and IQR and things like that, uh, among other topics. Um, I'd say on our quizzes, 99% will come from something I said in lecture, but there might be a chance that you don't remember I said something in lecture and it's on the quiz or something. I try not to. Um, try not. I try not to be too mean. I think I'm very fair with all of these quizzes. Uh, there's a few true/false questions about observational studies and experiments and the difference between those. I would emphasize, you know, reading the book to make sure you understand the differences um, for that, just because, uh, you know, because I do say a lot of stuff, but I don't necessarily write everything, every single thing I say up on the board, okay? And your notes probably include just what I've written on the board, is, is my opinion, okay? So, so you might say, you never covered this in class, and I might say, I did, I just didn't write on the board. So anyway, that's that. Let me just say a few things about the quiz. So the quiz is next week. We're going to get started at the beginning of class. Arrive on time so you can have the full amount of time for the quiz. 
If you um, have arrangements with the uh, disabilities students with disabilities office, it is your responsibility to schedule the quiz with that office. Okay, you're going to take the quiz with the office uh, by the by appointment, and then uh, you will join our class for lecture uh, when everyone else is done with their quiz. So the quiz is going to be about half an hour. So I would say come into our lecture classroom around 7:05. Okay, if you're if you're taking this quiz with the um, office for students with disabilities, okay, so you have to schedule your quiz with them. Come join us around 7:05. Um, everybody else, get here at 6:30 on time. We'll get started. I'll pass those out, and uh, and you'll take the quiz. Um, we'll, yes, question. Are we using the scan or No, you will need. Um, a calculator, okay, and a pencil, eraser if you want, uh, e eraser, but um, make sure your calculator is not your cell phone, okay? Make sure it works. Um, if you come to class and your calculator is broken or it ran out of batteries, I'm just going to say I'm sorry, do your best, okay? So um, bring a calculator, and you're not allowed to use your cell phone, you're not allowed to share calculators either, okay? Um, because answers in there, and there's history and the calculator and stuff like that. So, uh, no sharing. So bring your own stuff. Um, you are allowed a 3 by 5 note card, all right? Uh, and you can write notes on it, formulas, whatever you want, on the front and the back of that note card. Um, make sure it's a 3 by 5 note card, okay? Or if you're going to use a piece of paper, measure it with a ruler so that it's three by five, okay? Sometimes students try to bring a four by six or something that's not the right size, okay? Or they put it on a piece of paper and they tear it or something and it just, no. If, if you're too cheap to spend money to buy a three by five note card, okay? You can get like 50 for a dollar, okay? It's not, a, it's not too bad, but if you don't wanna do that and you're gonna cut a piece of paper out, that's fine. Just make sure it's, it's three by five and use scissors, all right? If, as I pass these out, if I spot a note card that doesn't comply, I'm gonna take it away, all right? I don't wanna be the bad guy, but I've given you proper warning, okay? You guys know the rules and what's expected. And I'm, that's, so, so don't, don't mess, okay? Don't, um, and you're not allowed to share note cards either, okay? If you make a note card and you forget it or something, I'm sorry, you can scramble to make a new one. But, uh, you know, you can bring extra note cards or something, but uh, but you can't share note cards, right? Um, in my opinion, the quiz is very fair. Um, you know, practice the stuff we've gone over in, in lecture and the, the topics that, um, that, that I mentioned on the, uh, the website. Okay, questions, yes? Uh, no, I, I, I haven't been doing that. Um, I suppose somebody could do something shady, but <laughs> I don't collect those, yes. Um, will you be allowing note cards for later quizzes? Yes, so you're going to be allowed a note card for all of our quizzes, okay? How many questions? <laughs> Uh, 30 minutes worth? I don't know. It's a, it's, it's a going to be a one sheet of paper front and back. All right. Um, it's fair. I don't. I'm not. You know. Yeah. Check. So it's going to cover up through the stuff I've covered tonight. So this second half of class, I'm going to cover more stuff. It's going to cover that stuff too. Okay. What about the midterms and the finals? We'll worry about those as those days come. All right. Worry. Don't worry about tomorrow, okay? Don't worry about tomorrow. All right. So here are, uh, so that's, ah, shucks. I didn't want to do it. Okay, sorry, let me just write these back really quick. Uh, 84. Uh, what was the smallest? I had 36. 36, 55. Uh, okay, whatever. The smallest was 36 and the biggest was 97, right? Yeah. Okay. So just to pretend I didn't erase these. All right. 
there is another graphic display that we can use for numeric data, all right? So far, what are the graphic displays or the charts that we've made for numeric data? Histogram and? Bar graph. Not a bar chart. Dot plot. Dot plot. See, we've learned histogram, dot plot, I guess stem and leaf if you want to consider that, okay? Bar chart is categorical data, all right? Bar chart is categorical. So we've done histogram and dot plot. And stem and leaf, I guess. There's one more, and that's called a box plot. What's that? Is that like a block? 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 I don't know what a block is. Block plot? A block plot? I'm not sure what a block plot is, but a box plot is what I'm talking about here. Okay. Any graphic summary of a numeric uh, data set requires what? Line. A number line. A number line, okay? <laughs> So we need a number line, all right? And in this case, our number line has to at least cover from the smallest to the biggest, okay? So I gotta go 30, 12 test scores that I erased unintentionally, not unintentionally, but I mistakenly erased, okay? So so the, uh, so the you already have them written down in your in your notes because you should have done this exercise and gotten the these median and uh, quartile numbers, okay? So the box plot consists of a box, which is why it's called a box plot, and then what we call whiskers that extend from the box. Okay? The box is defined by Q1, Q3, and the median. So Q1 is 63. Okay, so if that's 65, 63, I'm just kind of eyeballing this. But 63 is somewhere like that. Alright? And Q3 is 83, so again, eyeballing, I put a line there. So I have a box, uh, oops, that goes from Q1, Q1 forms the left edge of the box, Q3 forms the right edge of the box. And I'm going to draw a line in between at the median, okay? So again, this is why it's important that we always draw a number line so that our box is well-defined, okay? Because if you don't have a number line, your box is just, you won't know where to draw these lines, okay? So Q1, Q3, and then you draw another line somewhere in the box, and that's the median. Okay, the median is not necessarily going to be halfway between Q1 and Q3. It's just, it's right here. Okay? All right, from the box, whiskers go to the largest and smallest data points. Okay? Unless a data point is considered an outlier. And, uh, and I'll get to how we... Well, we won't actually get to it. So, so the largest data point I have is 97. Okay. So my whisker goes up to 97. Okay. And the smallest data point what was the second smallest data point I had? 3655? Yeah. Okay. Let's say 36 is an outlier. Okay? This is an outlier. And kind of borderline outlier. Right? So, so we would say, so over here our whisker would go down to 55. 
The smallest data point that I have that's not an outlier. And then the outlier is represented with a circle at 36. Okay? So this is an outlier. And the whiskers go to the largest and smallest points that aren't outliers. Okay? In this class, you don't have to worry about <coughs> figuring out exactly what an outlier is just from the set of numbers. Okay? In another class, you'd have to learn how to identify outliers. But in this class, we won't. But if I say 36 is an outlier, then this is what our um, box plot would look like. So in this case, the only outlier would be what's furthest away from, from the box plot? Uh, no, just yeah, don't, don't worry about how we've decided, okay? okay. I've, I've, I've said 36 is an outlier, okay? Some statisticians might disagree with me, all right? But I'd say, you know, most everybody else got between, kind of got in this middle range. Somebody didn't do so well on the test and got a 36, okay? So in that group of 10, I'd say 36 kind of stands out as an exceptionally poor performance. And so that would be an outlier, okay? So you don't have to be able to make a box plot on your own. But if you are presented with a box plot, you should be able to identify the largest point, the smallest point. What's the smallest point? in our box plot? 36. What's the largest point? 97. And you should be able to identify Q1, Q3, and the median from the box plot. Okay, And that's located by where the, um, the vertical lines and the, uh, and the box are. Yes? Why does your whisker end at 35? It ends at the smallest point that we have that's not an outlier. Okay, So I I said 36 is an outlier in this data set. Okay? We haven't covered how to identify outliers, but I will not make you guys learn that. So I'm saying 36 is an outlier. So what's the smallest data point that you have that's not an outlier? 55. So our whisker goes to that. Okay. All right, and the same, same if you had outliers on the other side, your whisker would go to the largest point that's not an outlier. Okay. Question? Yeah, if there's no outlier, the whisker would go all the way to the smallest point, okay? So if there's no outliers, your whiskers would go to the smallest point and largest point in your data set. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's tough to say. It's tough to say. Uh, just because of the one outlier, uh, I struggle to answer that question with confidence, okay? Okay, so that's something might like that might appear on the quiz. You have an outlier, uh, not outlier. You have a box plot, and you've got to be able to identify Q3, Q1, so on and so forth. All right, quick recap for just. Uh, don't shout out the answer because other students might have to think of this. So in your head, try to think of the answer here, okay? How much of the data is smaller than Q3? So don't shout out the answer. <laughs> okay, so if you didn't hear the answer, how much of the data is smaller than Q3? Okay. Don't, don't shout out. <laughs> And the answer is three quarters, or 75% of the data is smaller than Q3, okay? All right, okay, so then this should be easy. Again, don't shout it out. How much is smaller than Q1? Okay, don't shout it out. All right, so what's, now you can answer me. How much is smaller than Q1? 25%, one quarter. How much, don't shout this out again, how much is between Q1 and Q3? 
how much would be between Q1 and Q3? Think about it. Okay, and the answer? 50%. 50%, two quarters. Okay, so half of the data is between Q1 and Q3. Okay, so how much is outside of Q1 and Q3? 50%. Okay, so 50% is between Q1 and Q3. So what's not between there? So what's smaller than Q1 and bigger than Q3? Uh, one fourth is smaller than Q1, one fourth is bigger than Q3. So it also total of 50%. So the IQR covers the middle 50% of the data. All right. Um, how much, okay, don't shout this out either. How much is between Q1 and the median? Thought about the answer? How much is between Q1 and the median? One quarter, 25%, right? The median <coughs> is the second quartile or the halfway point. Q1 is the first quartile. So you've got one quarter in between Q1 and the median. Is that okay? But you said it's not necessarily the two, I mean the middle. Okay. So in terms of the value, the median is not necessarily half, um, halfway between Q1 and Q3 in terms of the value. However, in terms of how much data, how many data points are between Q1 and the median or Q1 and uh, the median and Q3, right? How many, how many data points were in our number set? Twelve. Twelve, right? How many? So, the entire span represents 12 test scores. Okay, how many test scores are between Q1 and Q3? Half of them, so six. How many are smaller than the median? Six. How many are bigger than the median? Six. How many are between Q1 and the median? Three. And median and Q3? Three. How many are bigger than Q3? So three. Okay. Each of these are one one fourth of twelve is three, okay? And how much is smaller than Q one? Three, right? And if one is an outlier, then two are represented by between here and here. Is that okay? So, so sometimes we forget that this represents there's twelve data points represented <coughs> by this box plot, or however many data points are in your set. Okay. So let's, uh, so we've talked about measures of center, the mean and the median. We've talked about two of our measures of spread, the range and the IQR. Okay, the last measure of spread that we haven't talk, talked about, but we will talk about right now, is the standard deviation. Okay, just like the range, just like the IQR, the standard deviation is a statistic, so it's a numeric summary of data. It's a statistic that tells us about the spread. told us how far apart is the biggest from the smallest. The IQR told us how far apart is Q3 from Q1. The standard deviation is a little bit odd. I feel like someone's trying to get in. Um, the standard deviation is a little bit different and it gives us an idea of what is the typical deviation from the mean. Okay, So this is... Um, a loose definition.
not exactly that, but it's a loose working definition. But just like the IQR, just like the range, you're going to get a number. It's a numeric summary that tells us about the spread. A statistic that tells us about the spread. And statistics are useful when you can compare one summary from one group with another summary from another group. And you can say, this group has a standard deviation of three. This group has a standard deviation of four. So what do you think that tells us about the groups? This group has more spread than this group. This group's standard deviation is three. This group's standard deviation is four. This group has more spread than this group because the standard deviation is a measure of spread. Okay? Just like the range, our class had a range of in term, for the age ages of students in this class, the 10 students that volunteered their age, we had a range of 13 years. If we went to a high school class, we might find a range of four years. This class has more spread in ages than the high school class. Okay? So if we find a standard deviation of three in one group and a standard deviation of four in another group, this group has more spread than this group. Is that concept okay? All right. Because the standard deviation, the concept is not hard, okay? I'll, put, I'll even write this one, okay? Less or smaller standard deviation means less spread. Here's the number line, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Is that okay? I'm going to draw a dot at each child. My mean is 13. Okay, that is my mean. What is the deviation of the oldest child from the mean? How far is the oldest child from the mean? He's two years away, right? How, how far is this child from the mean? One. How about this one? One. He's negative one. And this one is? Negative two. Negative two. Is that okay? Well, I'll, uh, I'll be. Is it, before I move on, is, is this okay? Is anyone confused? That's how I'm getting two and one and negative one and negative two. Okay, so we can think of these as kind of deviations from the mean, right? Every child is not the same age. They're different ages. Some are more different from the average than others. The 15-year-old and 11-year-old are two years apart from the average, or two years away from the average, whereas the 
12 to 14 year old are only one year away from the average, or away from the mean. Okay. So typical, so what would you say the typical distance from the mean is? It, that's a, it's, it's hard to say because it's not exactly the average, okay? So we're gonna do something funny to these numbers to get to this idea of typical, okay? But here we can see where the idea of a deviation comes from. And then the standard deviation is some way where we put all these together and we summarize basically these four deviations, okay? Because the deviation kind of gives us an idea of how spread out the numbers are or how far away they are from the mean. And then the standard deviation summarizes those deviation numbers. And that's why we call it the standard deviation. And it's just a number that summarizes the spread. So I'm going to write the formula for the standard deviation. It might seem a little intimidating at first, especially if you don't like formulas, but it's not too terrible. And we'll go over exactly how to use it, or you don't even have to use the formula. You can just write down steps of finding the standard deviation. is a summary of the deviations. Okay, standard deviation, the symbol for standard deviation is S. S for spread, for standard deviation.
guys finish copying those steps down. Okay, and we'll try this out. Alright, so if these are my four numbers, 15, 14, 12, and 11, these are the ages of four children in some family, our first step is to find the mean. We found the mean and we got 13. Okay. And that's okay, right? You add up four numbers, you divide by four, you get the mean 13. Don't mess this up. On a <laughs> quiz, it's worth double checking your mean. Because if you mess up the mean, everything else about this is going to be wrong. Okay? So step two, find the deviations. So we want to know, so we already did that, but I will just show you what it looks like, okay? So we can just write out our four numbers, 15, 14, 12, and 11. And the mean was 13, so I'm going to subtract 13 from each of these numbers. And what do we have? We see that 2 is, I mean, 15 is 2 more than 13. This is 1, negative 1. These are the deviations from the mean. This is how far the numbers are away from the mean. So that's step two. What's step three? Square the deviations. Okay, what does it mean to square something? Multiply it by itself. Multiply it by itself. Good. Squaring is not the square root. Squaring is multiplying by itself. What happens when you multiply a negative number by itself? And it becomes positive. Okay? So if we square all of these numbers, all of our numbers will be positive. Okay? So it's a common mistake. Some students square numbers and so they get negatives. Don't do that. Okay. So you square 2. Squared. So what is 2 squared? 1 squared. 1 squared. 2 squared. 4. Okay? We add these up. Add up the squares. So what do we get? If we add all of these numbers up. Ten. We get a total of 10. So I'm going to do 10 divided by n minus 1. What's n minus 1? Four. Four. Yeah, n is equal to 4. So divide by n minus 1. So this is n minus 1. Ten divided by three is equal to three point three three three. And so the last step is to take the square root. So I get the square root of three point three three three. Eight two five six. One point eight two six. Sure. Eight two five seven three. Okay. Yeah, three point three 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 is our variance. Okay. So uh, this is my standard deviation. Standard deviation <laughs> equals 1.826. The number right before you take the standard deviation, that's called your variance. Right, I mean, right before you take the square root, is called the variance. steps. So let's uh, so let me give you 
some numbers and tell you to find the standard deviation.
So that's, that's what we see. Now if I had given you a different set of numbers, then you would see the standard deviation would be different. So let's, let's just pretend, okay, we're not even going to bother calculating this. But let's say we saw another family, and the oldest kid is 15, the next kid is 12, the next kid is uh, 11, and the next kid is 7. If we found the standard deviation of this family, would they have a larger or smaller standard deviation than this family? So let's say this, this was the Smith family and this was the Jones family. Which family has the larger standard deviation? Jones. Jones family, right? Because, well, the standard deviation tells us about the spread, okay? And even though we didn't bother calculating the standard deviation of this family, of the Jones family, there's other clues that this family has a greater spread than this one, right? Like the range. We can see that the range here is bigger, okay? Now, not necessarily just because you have a bigger range over here and a smaller range over here will the standard deviations exactly line up. But with four numbers, it's pretty clear that the ages here are more spread out than they are over here, okay? So you see more spread here. So we have a larger standard deviation. Less spread, smaller standard deviation, okay? But everything is relative and it's all based on what we compare from one another, okay? There could be another family where the kids just went pop, 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 and they're like 15, 15, 14, 13, right? Okay, that happens. So, um, um, I, I knew a guy, and uh, he was of a certain uh, ethnicity, and I, I don't want to say what he said. But he was of a certain ethnicity, and he said when the kids are born nine months apart, they call that some, you know, his ethnicity twins, right? So, you know, it's like not exactly twins, but they're born, you know, all the kids are nine months apart. They go, oh yeah, we are, you know, my ethnicity is twins. So, um, but. okay. So that's the uh, formula for standard deviation, and this is the, um, these are the steps. Let me just show you how the formula relates. Yes, okay. So all of these steps are summarized in this formula, okay? If you don't like the formula, don't worry about it, all right? The very first step of finding the mean makes its appearance in the formula as x bar. x bar is the symbol for finding the mean. Okay? Finding the deviations shows up in the formula as this minus sign. Okay? That's where we subtract x bar, or the mean, from each number x, which is what we did as the second step. The 2 right here means squaring and that's the third step okay. the fourth step says add up the squared deviations and that shows up as this symbol here sigma is the fourth step okay. divide that total by n minus 1 and we see that right here in the denominator and then the last step taking the square root all the way on the outside as the square root. So when you see a formula, often it makes, they're written in such a way that you start on the, the most inner part and then you work your way outward. If you don't like formulas, don't worry about it. You can just learn these steps. So if I were to give you another set of numbers 
on your quiz, you would could be able to find the standard deviation yourself, yeah. right? Yeah. Good. <coughs> All right. The standard deviation is useful. and that we can use them to make comparisons. So we can, we can compare standard deviations from different groups, but by being able to compare standard deviations from different groups, we can actually compare the individuals from different groups. So let's say, um, so you know, sometimes you go to a party, you're telling a story, and then the person you're talking to, they say they they one up your story, right? You say, ah, you know, this and this happened, and they go, oh yeah, well this and this happened, and you're like, okay, that's great, all right. So, so what if you know we're talking about unusual things we saw today, right? And there's this one up position, okay? So someone says, ah, oh, you know what? I saw a really tall man today. And you say, well, how tall? And they said, you know, the man I saw, he had to have been like 6'5". There you go, oh, yeah. That's pretty tall. And then someone goes, oh yeah? I saw a woman, and she was really tall. <laughs> she was... No, no, no. She was 6'2". Uh, okay. And you're like, what? 6'2", that's taller than, I mean, that's shorter than this man who was 6'5". And you go, but have you ever seen a woman who's 6'2"? You go, yeah. No, I, no, I don't know. Maybe, yeah, but not, not very often, okay? And then someone else comes along and says, oh, yeah. I saw a man, and he was 6'8", six, six okay? All right, so now, so this guy concedes defeat. He says, all right, your really tall man is taller than my really tall man. But this person was like, uh, uh, you know, this person says, well, I don't know, is your tall man more or less, uh, more or less unusual than this woman who's 6'2"? What do you think? What's more unusual? The six eight, six foot eight man, or the six foot two woman. Six two woman. <laughs> so what's okay? Or what about a man who's someone else comes along and says, "I saw a man and he is six ten, which is the most unusual of these." The man. <laughs> okay, so somehow we're like, okay, the man who's six ten, that's really it. That's really, really tall. I'll give you that. That's really, really tall. Okay. This man who's 6'8", also very tall. And the woman who's 6'2", also very tall. But between the 6'2", 6 6'2", woman and the 6'8", man, which one is more unusual? Six two. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, this is how we can settle this debate. All right? We use the standard deviation. The standard deviation can be thought of as like a unit, okay? The unit itself is the standard deviation. And we can talk about how many standard deviations someone is away from the mean, okay? So if the average height of a man is, let's say, 5'10", a man who is 5'11", is one inch away from the mean, okay? If a standard deviation is three inches, then a man who's 5'11 is one third of a standard deviation away from the mean. Is that 
Is that concept okay? So let, let me just write this. Okay. So let's say, and these numbers are pretty close to being accurate, but not 100%. Okay. So let's say, let's say the mean height of men in the U.S. is uh, 70 inches. Okay. That's five foot ten. And let's say the standard deviation of height in the U.S. Uh, of height of men is three inches. Standard deviation is three inches. So this man is one third of a standard deviation above the mean. Conceptually, are these sentences okay? like 2.9 inches, all right? But we'll just round off to 3, and it's like 69.6 .6 inches, but we'll round off to 7. Yes? Um, why would you say it's one third of, of the standard deviation is 3, so like, let's say that guy was 3 inches above the mean, he would be one standard deviation? Yes. So if a man is 3 inches above the mean, he would be exactly one standard deviation above the mean. All right. If he is one standard devi deviation below the mean, how tall is this man? Five seven or sixty seven inches. Okay. If the mean is seventy inches and each standard deviation is three inches, and somebody was one standard deviation below the mean, he would be seventy minus three, sixty seven inches or five foot seven. Okay. So the number of standard deviations we are from the mean is called the z-score. Z-score, and this is the number of standard deviations a point is from the mean. is negative, that means the point is below the mean. If the z-score is positive, the point is above the mean. So the man who is six foot five is equal to seventy seven inches tall. What is this man's z score? Five 
Two and a third. The Z score is 2.333 or whatever. Okay, how did we get that? Well, we said 77 inches is 7 inches above the mean. Each standard deviation is 3 inches. So I do 7 divided by 3 and I get 2.333. So a formula that we can use, and I didn't want to reveal this too early because people might use this as a crutch, is we take the data point, we subtract off the mean, and we take that distance and divide by the standard deviation. So in our case, we do 77 minus 70 divided by 3, and I get 7 over 3. 2.333. Okay? So, tell me, find, give me the z score of the man who's 6'8, which is equal to uh, 80 inches, and the z score of the man who is 6'10, which is 82 inches. Okay, so go ahead and tell me there, or uh, do the calculations with your z-scores. your numbers just look up here so I can kind of get a gauge Write the answers here, and then we can go over how we got this. Is that what we got? Okay, great. Okay, so uh, in case you didn't get that, we just did z is equal to x minus x bar over s. So I did 80 minus x bar, which is 70, divided by the standard deviation of 3, and I get 10 divided by 3. 3.333, and over here I get 82 minus 70 over 3, 12 over 3, is 4. Alright, so the question is, which one was more unusual though? Okay, over here we had the woman who was 6 foot 2. Okay, women are on a different scale than men. Okay, so women in the U.S. have a mean height of 5 foot 4 or 64 inches and have a standard deviation of let's say 2.85 inches. So what is the z-score 
Do we all get an answer? Yeah. All right, and what's our Z score then? 3.509. Okay. 3.509. Okay. If we round to three decimal places. 3.5087, right? If the number that comes after the spot where you're rounding is five or bigger, you round up. So 3.509. Right. And that is, we did 74 minus 64 divided by 2.85, 10 over 2.85. And we get 3.509. Okay, so now we can settle our debate. We say, what was more unusual? The woman who's 6'2", the man who's 6'8", or the man who's 6'10"? Okay, so we look at the z-scores. The man who is 6'8 has a z-score of 3.33. The woman who, has, who is 6'2 has a z-score of 3.509. And the man who is 6'10 has a z-score of 4. Okay, so I'm going to just put the z-scores. So this guy was 2.333, uh, 3.509. 3.333 and z score of 4. So we can compare the z scores. And talk about what was most unusual, okay? So the most unusual is the man who's 610 followed by the woman who's 62 and then the man who was 68 and least unusual was the man who's 65 okay and that kind of matches our intuitive sense of heights and whatnot right so this way we can compare people from different groups or items from different groups or objects or whatever it is from different groups even uh, as long as we know the standard deviation that kind of puts put them on a similar scale. Is that okay? So this is the most extreme. And then second, third, and least extreme. Is that okay? Alright, just hang on just a Another couple minutes, okay? I, I try to time my things to end exactly exactly right. Alright, so these are really extreme, just just to let you know, right? If you see a man who's six ten, you'd say, Wow, that dude is tall. Okay? And the truth is, anything that has a Z score of more than two or negative two can be considered unusual, okay? So about two-thirds uh, two of people um, 
more like 68% have z-scores between negative 1 and 1, okay? Or the book says are within one standard deviation of the mean. Okay? 95%, about 95%. Z-scores between negative 2 and 2, which means they are within <coughs> two standard deviations of the mean, right? Because the Z-score is how many standard deviations you are from the mean. So about 95% of people have Z-scores between 2 and negative 2. And almost everyone So almost everyone, but not everyone, have z-scores between minus 3 and positive 3. Okay? So that means only about 3 in 1,000 people have z-scores bigger than 3. Okay? So, how often will we encounter a woman who's 6'2"? Okay, we'd probably have to see over a thousand people, and then, yeah, we might run into a woman who is 6'2 or taller, okay? And uh, that's probably true, right? If, uh, you've probably seen tens of thousands of people in your lifetime, and how many of those were women who were over 6'2"? Probably not that very many, okay? So, this is called the empirical rule. It's covered in your book a little bit more. Um, but the idea of finding a z-score and using the z-score to compare between groups, you'll have to know, okay? Do we need to memorize those, like, percentage? You don't need to memorize those, okay? All right, we'll see you guys next week. Good luck as you guys study.